And that's really what the IBI, the International Biochar Initiative, and a large part of the biochar community is promoting is that we really need to think about biochar and develop biochar as a way to manage waste and, uh, this might sound, sound tacky, but turn trash into treasure. We have a lot of it, yeah. and uh, it's not just we have a lot of it. In a lot of areas, we don't have enough, but in some areas, we've got way too much. In the Shenandoah Valley, about 85% of the poultry litter on poultry farms is actually exported off those farms because they've got too much to apply compared to their nutrient management plan and what it permits. So if we can paralyze it, we can, bridge, we can decrease the mass by about 60% and end up with a value-added product. This is a photograph of the system that we use. It actually it can process about four tons of coat litter a day, and about 40% of that ends up in the biochar. Uh, the coat litter goes in, or wood, anything with uh, carbon in it that's dry enough to burn, uh, will burn in, in this. And it's got a retention time, it only takes about four seconds uh, before the biochar is produced. Whereas with a uh, slower temperature, it takes uh, a day or more to create your biochar. So this system uh, rapidly converts the biomass into biochar. The litter drops down into, it's called a fluidized bed. And basically we heat up sand to about 450 degrees Celsius. And so when the compost falls on the sand, it pretty much instantaneously separates into its different fractions. It separates into the solid phase, which is the biochar separates into the oils and it separates into a gas. So that machine actually captures the oil and they are doing research at Virginia Tech to use that as a heating oil. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities for that. The reactor also captures that gas and feeds it back around it, recombusts it um, to uh, help spur the heating process on. So some of the biochar properties from the poultry litter. Poultry litter has a pH of about 8 to 9, they obviously alkali, so the biochar that comes from that has a pH of about 9.5, so it is a liming agent. The soils in this area tend to be acidic, so it's beneficial for the soils. The wood biochar it doesn't have as much ash, and it had a pH of about 6.5, so it's very slightly acidic. What happens to the... Um, nitrogen and phosphorus when you pyrolyze poultry litter, is that mostly lost? The nitrogen is mostly lost and the uh, phosphorus is, is almost entirely kept. The pyrolysis unit, the one I showed you the photograph of, it keeps larger particles in there until they combust and then it's uh, the flow of air uh, pushes that out so it has to be a fine particle size before it gets out. We're having some success so far just by looking at the height of the plant. So this picture is of two different rates. Um, on the right would be the control, so there's no biochar in these plants. On the right it's just without nitrogen and then with nitrogen. Then on the other side, this is biochar at 0.5%, so you can think that would be roughly um, is that 10 tons per acre, uh, you can think. And you can notice just from the scale of the pictures and the rulers, you can see the height differences in the plants. And so this is after a month and a half of growing. And you can notice color differences in between the plants and that's uh, due to the nutrient uptake. So the nutrients that are in the biochar, we're finding our plant available and the plant responses in these pictures is kind of showing that. And the, I'll also say that this soil where the peppers are, where we incorporated it and the compost, is some of the poorest soil we have on the farm with the lowest levels of organic matter and because we, we test every two or three years. So I don't know whether it's the biochar, the compost, or the 48, 90 degree days we had this yeah. year, but the pepper plants are really robust, much better than last year, so I don't know if there's any cumulative effect yet or not, but certainly for what's in a place that's been hard to grow a decent crop, it's a pretty decent looking stand. Did I hear that this poultry litter biochar has a phosphorus content or a phosphate content of 5%? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So if you put on 10 tons per acre, you just added um, 1,000 pounds per acre of phosphate. 
So way above your agronomic optimum. We're starting to find that reasonable application rates of this stuff would be around one to three tons per acre. Uh -huh. Are gonna if you apply it based on your soil test peak, that you're gonna find rates that are much lower than you would see for the hardwood char, simply because exactly what you're saying, the the phosphorus content is so high that that's what's gonna limit your. Thing with biochar and, and tackling the phosphorus problem is that if you make biochar from the poultry litter, you're reducing the amount of mass that you would have to move around if you just want to get it out of a region. And this is a simple germination study across two different soils with this poultry litter biochar and you can see um, basically from the bar graph, I know you can't read the numbers, but you see there is a point at which it drops off and nothing will germinate um, in those soils and it happens uh, at two and a half percent by weight. We notice a reduction in the amount of germination. Now this is an extremely high field rate application. Two and a half percent by weight is approximately 50 tons per acre. So that's a lot of biochar in the field, but not in the greenhouse. You can picture using biochar in a pot study or something in the greenhouse, and it's very easy to get up to two and a half percent by weight. So you gotta be very careful um, how much you're adding. These two plants are, uh, one of them is in a soil with 5% biochar by weight, and it's dropping its bottom leaves. It's uh, the leaves are very, um, if you touch them, they're very brittle. And so these are, uh, we think, results um, of a salt toxicity where this, the, the plant is having to work so hard to overcome what's called the, I guess it's the osmotic potential in the soil, having to work to fight to bring that water in from the soil. So they're actually uh, really, really struggling and this treatment has already died. So the 5%, we lost all of those. And it lines up with the germination study. So. In my mind, that's good news because it shows that you can predict at what point is the biochar going to become toxic. If you really wanted to sequester a lot of carbon or stabilize or expand the organic matter a lot, and you want to avoid the salt effect, you could put on 5 or 10 tons per acre this year and then do it again next year because the salt effect is short-lived. So the salts will be taken out of the system through leaching. You just have to monitor your soil test um, and your soluble salts to ensure that they are uh, being taken out of the system. Notice that one of the soils here, your, your germination actually seemed to go up somewhat at the moderate rate. So, do you, was that significant or is that random? It is statistically significant. I oh. think it's um, because the biochar, the fine particle size, that's a Bojack sandy loam. So, it has a tendency to crust very rapidly to dry out in the top layer. And I think the, the uh, biochar could be potentially be surrounding the seed and help keep that seed moist until it is able to germinate. The next picture I'll show you is biochar in the soil one year after application. So the picture I'm sending around, you can see how it's applied in a very even um, distribution over the plot. And we'll actually see that when you come back in the soil a year later, you find it tend to find it in clumps, you know, almost like meatballs spread all throughout the soil. We're not sure if this is from the mechanical incorporation or if the biochar potentially has some sort of charge characteristics that allow it to segregate. Um, we see this in other types of soils at high altitudes. but. That's research that's ongoing and we're working on whether or not that is uh, significant or whether um, we're seeing things. This is a list of conclusions that we can come up with from just one year's data. The poultry litter biochar is a good, good source of your calcium, magnesium, um, phosphorus. So these uh, micro and macronutrients are contained in there and they are plant available. So that's good news. Uh, there can be potential problems with salt, but if you're applying it in reasonable rates and you're monitoring your soil tests, you shouldn't come into any problems and those salts can be leached and removed from the system. This poultry litter biochar has a pH of around 9.5, so it has a very good liming effect on your soils and we've noticed that from the soils from this side, a bump in pH where we're actually taking the pH up. Uh, a lot of the wood char that we used on the first year had a pH of around 6.5 to 6.8, so it had a lower pH, and we noticed that, of course, it didn't take the pH up. Poultry litter biochar can be viewed as a value-added product. <laughs> um, pass it around. Thank you. Brought to you by the Avian Aquamizer, our poop-free chicken water. Visit us on the web at www.avianaquamizer.com.